This video is an introduction to direct current DC circuits. In this video, we'll discuss what is a circuit, we'll introduce some basic terminology used in circuit analysis, we'll discuss some conventions as it relates to current, and we'll introduce Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's current and voltage laws. So what is a circuit? A circuit is a closed loop path that allows charge to flow from a source through circuit elements and back to the source. Sources include batteries, cigarette lighter adapters, wall outlets, and power supplies. Batteries come in a variety of shapes and sizes. You can think about the standard AA, AAA, C cells, D cells that you might buy at a grocery store, an electronics store. Some are rechargeable, some are disposable. They have different chemistry. You can have lead acid batteries, lithium ions, alkaline batteries, nickel metal hydrides, nickel cadmium. There's a lot of different uh, batteries, and those are the fundamental building blocks of most DC circuits. Cigarette lighter adapters, like you find uh, in vehicles, also can be considered a DC power source. For the most part, they just connect directly to the battery, so that can also be, think be thought of as a battery-driven circuit. Wall outlets that you would see in homes and offices are AC current sources, alternating current, and those we will discuss in much more detail later on in the course. Power supplies, which you might find in computers and also laboratory settings, convert the alternating current coming out of a wall outlet into direct current so they can be used in DC circuits. There are various kinds of circuit elements. You can think about most of the appliances that you see in your home as circuit elements, and those are built out of various building blocks, including resistors, diodes, capacitors, inductors. You can even think of light bulbs, motors, and pumps as circuit elements. Let's take a look more in depth at some of these passive circuit elements. Passive circuit elements absorb energy. So the most common kinds include resistors, capacitors, and inductors. Resistors, like you see here in the bottom left, come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Usually they're cylindrical, cylindrical or hourglass shaped, and they impede the flow of electrons. What's happening in electric circuits, our electrons are getting excited and they're trying to move through the circuit from one element to the next. And resistors actually slow down the ability of electrons to flow through that circuit. And if you have a higher resistance, that becomes more of a blockade to electrons, making it more difficult for these electrons to flow through the circuit. As these electrons flow through the resistors, they dissipate energy in the form of heat. The symbol for a resistor is this jagged line like you see down here at the bottom. Capacitors are parallel plates that store charge. They are found in a variety of circuits, including camera flash units, filters, uh, many other elements use capacitors to store charge. They can also be used to smooth out signals. And capacitors are represented by this parallel plate symbol that you see here. Some capacitors are also polarized, meaning they have to be in a certain orientation in the circuit. And if that's the case, then what you'll see is a plus indicating the orientation of the circuit. Some of them come in cylindrical shapes, like the ones you see down here. Some of them come in disc shapes, like you see here. In most cases, there'll be something that separates those two parallel plates. It could be air, it could be a layer of paper, or cardboard. There could also be a dielectric or a chemical compound that separates those two plates. And depending upon what's separating those plates, you're going to see different capacitive properties inside the capacitor. Inductors are coils wrapped around a core. So typically they come in a torus shape or donut shape, about like this. And you'll see various wires wound around that core. These are the fundamental building blocks of electric motors and can also be found in electromagnets and relays. This is the schematic symbol for an inductor down here. Some basic terminology before we get too far into this. Current and voltage are unfortunately used somewhat interchangeably by people who don't really know a whole lot about basic electricity and circuit analysis, but they are very different concepts. Current is the flow of charge through a circuit over time, whereas voltage is the electrical potential measured at one point relative to another in a circuit. It could be measured across a particular element in a circuit, or it could simply be measured one uh, point relative to a different point in the circuit. Resistance, as we've already talked about, is the measure of a substance's ability to impede the flow of charge. We can illustrate this with a ramp and an object trying to slide down the ramp. And if you remember back to your Physics 1 course, 
as you increase the potential, that is, you raise the height of this ramp, you increase the gravitational potential energy of an object trying to slide down a ramp. And when you do that, that allows this object to gain more and more speed as it slides down the hill. So if it's higher here, then that particle can slide faster than it would if we had a lower potential. The same is true in a circuit. If you have a higher potential, that is, you have a battery that's rated at a higher voltage, then you can give rise to more current than you would if you had a lower rated battery. At the same time, resistance is actually trying to resist the flow of electrons through an element. And you can think about that as being very similar to friction. So if we have a very smooth surface, then this particle can slide easily down the ramp. If we had a jagged surface or something that was sticky, it would be more difficult. You would have a higher coefficient of friction for that object to slide down the ramp. And that is very similar to how electrons behave when they're going through areas of higher or lower resistance. Resistance makes it more difficult for them to go through the circuit. This brings up Ohm's law, which is the most fundamental equation used in circuit analysis. And it tells us that the electrical potential dropped by an element, V, is equal to the current through that element multiplied by the resistance of that particular element. And we're going to use that equation as we go through this course. And if you take a circuit analysis class from an engineering program, you will see that equation used quite a bit. Before we get too much into equations and doing some problem solving, I want to make sure you understand the difference between alternating and direct current, AC versus DC. So alternating current appears like you see up here at the top. You have a sinusoidal pattern. And if you actually look at the signal coming out of your wall outlet, what you will see is that you have 60 hertz in the US. If you go over to Europe, you may see 50 hertz. And here in the US, you'll see 120 volts. So you're going to see a swing that goes positive and negative, meaning the current is sometimes going to be going one direction and at other times going to be going the other direction. And it's going to alternate at 60 hertz here in the US. Direct current is going to be continually going in one direction, and it's going to be at a fairly constant level. As we all know, batteries dissipate over time, and you may have difficulty uh, using an appliance as that battery becomes drained. But for the most part, batteries and various DC circuits are going to behave like this. We have a flat line, a steady constant voltage over time. Another convention we need to discuss is electron flow versus conventional current. So in reality, if you have a battery like this, a battery has a positive terminal up here. That's where the button is on the battery. And at the bottom, you have a negative terminal. That's the flat line. If you have a 9-volt battery, you can clearly see the two terminals labeled plus and minus. And in reality, hopefully you remember from your chemistry class, electrons are negatively charged. And electrons are getting excited, and they're flowing through the circuit elements. They might run into a lamp or various other elements, and then they're flowing back to the battery in a closed loop path like this. And so in reality, current is flowing from negative to positive. But under conventional current, we represent current as flowing from positive to negative. So the convention used is actually the reverse of what's happening in reality. So it's important to keep in mind when you're reporting answers, you will typically report them in conventional current, which will be the current flowing from areas that are positive to areas that are negative. Two typical configurations of circuits that you're going to see are going to be series, like you see here on the left, and parallel, like you see here on the right. Series circuits connect one element, and then the next element, and then the next element in one loop, like you see here. Parallel elements are connected just like parallel lines. You've got one element connected parallel to the next, parallel to the next. And there's some special properties of these two different configurations. If you have a series circuit, like you see here on the left, then the current through each element is the same. That is, any current, now we're going to use conventional current this time, if we have any current coming from positive and going through this resistor, there's no place for it to branch off. So all of that current is going to go through R2. And as that current goes through R2, there's no other place for it to branch off. So all that current is going to go through R3. And so the current through the battery is going to be exactly the same as the current through any given element. When you're in parallel, the currents may be different, but the voltage across each element is going to be the same. So all of these elements that are connected to this point down here, this point 
is at the same potential. You just have a wire, so there's no way for there to be a higher or lower potential. They're all at the same potential down here. And there's a different but equal potential up here at the top. And that's going to be at the same potential that the battery's at. So if you take the bottom point to be your zero volt or ground reference, then this top point, every point along that line is going to be at the same potential of whatever the voltage is of your battery. And so you're going to see the same voltage drop across R1, as you see across R2, as you see across R3. Regardless of the size of those resistors, any element that is in parallel is going to have the same potential drop across it. In the real world, circuits are usually not going to be this simple. So you'll see some elements that are in parallel and some elements that are in series. And so what you may want to do is find a way to find an equivalent representation that gets it back to the basics of parallel or series circuits. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So before we get into that, let's do a practice problem. So if you have this parallel circuit like you see here, and we're going to have R1 is going to be a 10 ohm resistor, R2 is going to be a 20 ohm resistor, R3 is going to be a 40 ohm resistor, and we're going to have a 1.5 volt battery, which is the nominal voltage of a typical C cell, D cell, AA, AAA that you would pick up at the store. The question is, two questions actually. First, what is the current through each resistor? So what's the current through here, what's the current through there, and what is the current through there? And our second question is, how much voltage is dropped across each resistor? Well, the second question is actually the easiest question to answer, because if you remember, the voltage dropped across each resistor, since we're in parallel now, is going to be equivalent to the voltage of that battery. So VR1, that is the voltage across R1, is going to equal the voltage across R2, it's going to equal the voltage across R3, and that's going to equal the voltage of our battery, which is 1.5 volts. The next question we can answer by using Ohm's law. So if we remember Ohm's law says V equals IR, that is the potential or the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. And we can rearrange that a little bit and get it to the form of I equals V over R. And so now we know the voltage dropped across each of those resistors. We know the resistance of each of those resistors and we can easily compute the current. So here, the current through R1 is going to equal the voltage dropped across R1, which is 1.5 volts, divided by the 10 ohms of resistance in R1. So that gives us 0.15 amps. Likewise, R2, we have the same voltage drop, 1.5 volts. We'll divide that by 20 ohms, giving us 0.075 amps, or 75 milliamps. And R3, very similarly, 1.5 volts divided by 40 ohms, giving us 0 0.0375 amps, or 37.5 milliamps. As mentioned before, sometimes if you have a complicated circuit, it's nice to find an equivalent resistance. That allows us to simplify our circuit. We don't have to look at each element individually. We can look at them collectively by finding one resistance that is equivalent to several resistances. If you have resistors in series, you can find an equivalent by simply summing up all of those resistances that are in series with one another. And if you have resistors in parallel, you can find an equivalent using this reciprocal relationship. So the equivalent resistance, REQ, is going to equal one over the sum of the reciprocals of each of those individual resistances. And we'll use that here in a moment as we solve some problems. Kirchhoff's laws tell us two things. One. Kirchhoff's current law tells us that the current flowing into any point on a circuit is equal to the current flowing out of that point. So you may have several branches flowing out, you may have several branches flowing in, but any current flowing into any point on the circuit has to be matched by currents flowing out. Kirchhoff's voltage law tells us if we travel around any closed loop path in a circuit, the total gains and losses sum to zero. So you may think of voltage gains coming from sources such as batteries. You may think of voltage losses being in passive elements such as capacitors and resistors. And over any closed loop path, the sum of the gains and the losses must go to zero. So we can use what we've just learned to solve this problem. So we have the same resistors, but we've reconfigured them. We're using the same battery, but now we have a series circuit instead of a parallel circuit. And so our battery is 1.5 volts, and then somewhere across these three resistors, we're going to see a total drop 
of 1.5 volts. So we're going to gain 1.5 volts here, and then across these three resistors all total, we're going to lose 1.5 volts. That's what Kirchhoff's voltage law tells us. And so again, we ask the same questions. Number one, what is the current through each resistor? Number two, how much voltage is dropped across each resistor? Now, if you remember, this is a series circuit, so the current is going to be the exact same through every resistor. And to figure out what that current is, let's first figure out the equivalent resistance of all three of these resistors. And that can be found simply by summing the three resistances together. So if we have 10 ohms, 20 ohms, and 40 ohms, that gives us an equivalent resistance of 70 ohms. And then we can simply use Ohm's law to figure out what that current is going to be. So we know the currents are equal, and they're going to equal the voltage of the battery divided by the resistance of that equivalent resistor. So we can take 1.5 volts, divide it by 70 ohms, and we simply get 0 0.0214 amps, or 21.4 milliamps. Now that we figured out the current, we know that's the same current through all of those resistors, we can again use Ohm's law and figure out the voltage dropped across each of those resistors. So we can use Ohm's law and say that the voltage dropped across R1 is going to equal the current through R1 multiplied by the resistance of R1. And we can do the same thing for R2 and R3. Remember, all the currents are the same, so that's what you see right here. And we're simply multiplying by the different resistances. And we get these different voltages that you see here. And to check ourselves, remember what we said. All the voltage gains in a loop have to be met and equaled out by all the voltage drops around that loop. We can't have any net change in potential. If I start at this point, I'm going to have a gain from my battery. I'm going to have a drop across R1, a drop across R2, and a drop across R3. And all those gains and drops have to balance out. So if we add up all of these voltage drops, what do we get? 1.498 volts. And accounting for a little bit of a rounding error, that balances out with our 1.5 volts that we're seeing from the battery. So what have we seen? We have seen that a circuit is a complete loop path containing a voltage source, could be multiple voltage sources, and circuit elements. We've looked at the difference between AC and DC circuits. We've learned Ohm's law, which is the fundamental equation used in circuit analysis. We figured out how to determine equivalent resistances for series and for parallel circuits, and we can use those to simplify complicated circuits into basic circuits that we know how to analyze. And we've introduced Kirchhoff's laws, which allow us to analyze complex circuits and to check that analysis on some simple circuits like you just saw. Thank you for your time. Have a great day.